Welcome, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. I'm Charles Hartgrove, and I serve as the Associate Director of the Virginia Institute of Government at the University of Virginia's Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service. Our goal is to serve as a central navigator for local governments, assist in building governance capacity, and developing dynamic leaders at all levels. We have a curated portfolio of services, partnerships, and best practices that provide value to our Virginia local government members and communities outside the Commonwealth. We also serve as a home of a senior executive institute and lead professional development programs available to local government leaders across the country. The Cooper Center, our parent organization led by Dr. Larry Terry, serves leaders across Virginia and beyond by combining decades of knowledge about government communities and the people of Virginia with contemporary and advanced research, analytical expertise, and focused training for high performance. A couple announcements before we begin. First, all participant microphones and cameras will be off. During the presentation, please add your questions to the Q&A box and we will moderate those questions for our guest once he is finished before the end of the program. It is our pleasure to host this webinar today about the book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. The book highlights an explosive and alarming history that finally confronts how American governments in the 20th century deliberately imposed residential racial segregation on metropolitan areas nationwide. This New York Times bestseller was initially released in 2017, although due to several events and the continued civil unrest in our country, it has received considerable renewed interest during the past year. Before I introduce our guest, I want to thank our fund funding partners for this event, the Virginia Chapter of the American Planning Association and the Virginia Association of Housing and Community Development Officials. Thanks to the leadership of both organizations for collaborating with us on this event. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Richard Rothstein. He's the author of The Color of Law. He is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. In addition to this book, he is the author of many other articles and books on race and education. Previous influential books include Class in Schools, Using Social, Economic, and Educational Improvements to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap, and Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Charles. And thanks to all of you for engaging with me on this topic uh, today. Um, as you all know, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging segregation and uh, law schools, then in colleges and universities, and then in 1954 persuaded the Supreme Court to prohibit legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown decision, Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 gave inspiration to a movement of civil rights activists who engaged in marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives in that struggle. Uh, in all, but by the end of the, the 1960s, uh, that civil rights movement had uh, persuaded much of the country that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both African-Americans and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. And that movement then, with that understanding shared by much of the country, but not everyone, uh, succeeded in abolishing segregation and public accommodations and uh, interstate transportation and employment. And in 1968, in the wake of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, the civil rights movement succeeded in getting a fair housing law passed that prohibited ongoing segregation in um, the sale and rental of housing, ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. But then the civil rights movement ended and left untouched the biggest segregation of all which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Everyone that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black. How could it be if we persuaded much of the country that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy? How could we have left untouched the biggest segregation of all? I think partly it's because it's hard to desegregate neighborhoods. If we pass an ordinance prohibiting segregation in restaurants, the next day you can go to any restaurant you want. If we pass a law prohibiting segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, uh, blacks and whites, 
liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, adopted a national myth, a rationalization that we give ourselves to excuse ourselves from redressing the biggest segregation of all. And that myth goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of colleges and universities and schools and restaurants and buses, that was all done by government. If the federal government was doing it, it was a civil rights violation, a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a civil rights violation, a violation of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And if we have a civil rights violation, we have an obligation under the Constitution, all of us as American citizens, to remedy it. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. It wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy of any kind. That just sort of happened by naturally, by accident. It happened because maybe bigoted white homeowners or landlords wouldn't sell or rent to African-Americans in white neighborhoods. Or maybe businesses in the private economy uh, wouldn't um, uh, arrange for African-Americans to live in, in uh, the same neighborhoods as whites, banks, real estate agencies, developers, private businesses, not government agencies. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because people like to live with each other the same race. We choose to self-segregate that way. We feel more comfortable that way. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just the result of income differences between blacks and whites. That's the reason we're segregated. All of these individual, personal, bigoted, but private sector, non-governmental actions and decisions is what's created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves what happened naturally can only unhappen naturally, but happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. We give a name to this explanation. We say that what we've got is de facto segregation, just something that sort of happened in fact, but not in law. Well, I spent much of my time prior to writing this book, The Color of Law, that I'm uh, drawing this talk from, studying education policy. Uh, I wasn't much uh, writing about housing or studying housing. In the 1990s and 2000s, I was doing much of my work criticizing the dominant educational theory of the country, which is that at the time that we had an achievement gap between black and white students, African-American children achieve on average at lower levels than whites. And the reason we had an achievement gap, we told ourselves is because African-American um, children have teachers with low expectations of them who don't just try very hard. And if we can make teachers try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. We enacted that view, it was a widespread view, shared across the political spectrum into a law, the No Child Left Behind law in 2000, that required that we test children every year and hold teachers and schools accountable for that, those test scores. And the law said that if we do that, the achievement gap will disappear in a matter of seven years. It was a ludicrous theory, but as I say, shared across the political spectrum of course, the achievement gap didn't disappear. We've got the same achievement gap now that we had then um, to all intents and purposes. It's um, uh, the only thing the law uh, accomplished was it got schools to uh, abandon a well-rounded curriculum and focus all their attention on math and reading in order to raise test scores. Um, but I tried to explain in the writing I was doing, uh, columns I was writing, uh, that of course, there are some teachers with low expectations, some that don't try very hard, but that's not the reason we have an achievement gap. The main reason we have an achievement gap is because of the social and economic disadvantages that so many African-American children come to school with that prevents them from taking advantage of what the best schools have to offer. So for example, I remember writing one column, um, I was a New York Times education columnist, and I remember writing one column about asthma as you may know, African-American children in urban neighborhoods in this country have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children in, um, uh, in suburban neighborhoods, four times the rate, it's an enormous difference. And African-American children have asthma at much higher rate because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more trucks driving by their homes, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment. And if a child has asthma, uh, that child is likely to be up at night, wheezing, more likely at least than a child without asthma. It's not true in every case, but more likely if a child has asthma and then the child will come to school drowsy the next day. Uh, and if a child is drowsy, 
that child is not going to achieve as well as a child who comes to school well rested. It doesn't make a big difference. It doesn't explain much of the achievement gap, but then you begin to think of all of the other social and economic disadvantages that low-income African-American children come to school with, uh, asthma, lead poisoning that has a measurable impact on IQ, homelessness, economic insecurity. You start to add all these things up and you pretty much explain the achievement gap. And then I realized in, in thinking and writing about this, one thing, if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity, what happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these disadvantages, these challenges? How can such a school ever be expected to achieve at the same level as a school where children come healthy and well-rested and well-nourished and in secure homes? You can't have that expectation no matter how many times you write it into law. Uh, the, uh, uh, so long as you have uh, children concentrated in schools like that, they're gonna have lower average achievement. What we call schools uh, where we concentrate children with those disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And schools are more segregated today than they have been at any time in the last 45 years of this country. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think that maybe neighborhood segregation was an educational issue, not just a housing issue. And that's how I came to this topic. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision that evaluated a, a program of two school districts, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Both of them had a very, very trivial school desegregation plan. They permitted parents to choose the school in which their child, which their child would attend. But if the choice was going to intensify segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't do so. So if you had an all white or mostly white school, one place left and both a black and a white child applied for that last remaining place, the black child would be given some preference in order to help to desegregate the school. It was a trivial, trivial program. You don't have one place left very often and have to make that kind of choice. But the Supreme Court evaluated this program. It denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. Uh, the opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He acknowledged that the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated. He said accurately that they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And then he went on to say that those neighborhoods were segregated without government involvement by private bigotry, by people wanting to live with each other in the same, same neighborhoods, by private businesses, not government, by economic differences. And he said, we call that de facto segregation. And if you have de facto segregation, something the government didn't create, government is prohibited under the constitution from doing anything to remedy it. Well, I read this decision and I remembered reading about something that happened some years before in Louisville, Kentucky, one of these two districts. In Louisville, there was a, a homeowner, a white suburban homeowner in a single family home in a white suburb called Shively, who had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville, renting an apartment. He, the friend was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child, wanted to move to a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home, resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob of white neighbors surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop it. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop that. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15 year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition, for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the prosecutors, the entire criminal justice system, all state actors, all agents of, of government um, were engaged in a conspiracy to ensure that blacks and whites could not live amongst each other in, in a Louisville suburb. I began to investigate it further, and I found that there were hundreds and hundreds of cases nationwide all over the country, uh, in Richmond, in New York, in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Chicago, um, Denver, Los Angeles, San Francisco, of police protected, frequently police organized and led mob violence designed to drive African-Americans out of homes, 
that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Every one of these where the police were involved either in protecting, organizing, or leading mob violence was a violation of the Constitution, a violation of the 14th Amendment, the civil rights violation that we have an obligation to remedy, but that we've never undertaken that obligation. And I began to look into it further, and I found that it wasn't just state-sponsored violence that led to the segregation that we have today, but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies, racially explicit, designed to ensure that blacks and whites could not live near one another. Every one of those was a civil rights violation, a violation of the Constitution that we've never remedied. Well, let me, in the few minutes we have together today, describe a, a perhaps one or two of the most powerful federal policies that the federal government followed uh, in uh, creating segregation in this country. Perhaps the most powerful is a program that the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration embarked upon in the immediate post-World War II period when millions of returning war veterans were coming home, uh, needing housing for whom no housing was available. Uh, those returning war veterans, black and white, were settling in urban areas, many of which were integrated. We had much more integration at that time in this country than we have today. Residential integration, simply because we were a manufacturing economy. Factories needed to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals. And workers, most of whom didn't have cars, had to be able to walk to work. So we had broadly integrated neighborhoods. But the federal government embarked on a program in the post-World War, post -World War II period to move the white families out of those urban areas, as well as the returning white war veterans, into single family homes in all white suburbs from which African-Americans would be excluded by public policy. This was a explicit policy of the federal government, racially explicit, and it created all white suburbs, really a white noose around every metropolitan area of this country. Perhaps the uh, best known of these uh, projects was Levittown, east of New York City, but they exist everywhere in the country, uh, every metropolitan area. Uh, the builder of Levittown, Levitt, wanted to put 17,000 homes in an area, suburban area, rural area at that time, east of New York. No bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money to build that, that development. Uh, we were in a suburban country at that time. They thought that uh, he was a, it was a crazy idea. Uh, he couldn't get the money to do it. The only way he could get the bank loans to buy the land and build 17,000 homes in one place was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, submitting his plans for the development, the materials he was going to use, the design of the homes, the layout of the streets, and a required commitment that he never sell a home to an African-American. The Federal Housing Administration even required that Levitt and builders like him all over the country place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans and rental to African-Americans. This was a racially explicit program of the federal government. It was not the action of rogue bureaucrats uh, doing this on their own. It was written out in a federal policy manual, the underwriting manual of the Federal Housing Administration that was distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of builders, of developers to build suburban developments, suburban projects. Uh, the, the manual said you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a, uh, a loan to a developer who was going to sell to African-Americans in a white project. The manual went so far as to say that you couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee a proposed project that was going to be for whites only if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. Inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. This notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. This is how the country was suburbanized for whites only and African-Americans restricted to living in urban areas for the most part. Well, those homes were inexpensive. They were for working class, middle class families, returning war veterans. Uh, they sold at the time for about $8,000 a piece, um, $7,000 a piece. In today's money, that's $100,000 inexpensive homes. Um, any family, any breadwinner uh, 
who uh, has a job in the post-war economy at that time, could afford to buy a home for $100,000 uh, with a long-term mortgage. Monthly payments were lower than uh, they would likely be paying for rent in urban areas. Returning war veterans were required to make no down payment. That's how the white working class and middle class was suburbanized. But over the next couple of generations, they became wealthier. Their homes appreciated in value. Today, those homes in Levittown or any other uh, suburban location like that, anywhere in the country, no longer sell for $100,000. They sell for $300,000, $400,000, dollars $500,000, in some places a million dollars or more. The white families who bought those homes uh, with a federal subsidy uh, gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the appreciation and value of their homes from the equity that they gained. They used it to send their children to college. They used it to take care of uh, temporary emergencies, maybe temporary unemployment. They used it to um, finance their retirements. And they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans who could have afforded those homes at the time were prohibited from participating in this wealth generating program. The result is that today, uh, on average, African American family incomes are about 60%, 60% of white family incomes. There's a whole story behind that disparity. I don't have time to go into it today, but you'd think that if there was a 60% income ratio, family income ratio, there'd be a 60% family wealth ratio as well. Uh, someone with a similar income can save a similar amount of money. But in reality, although there's a 60% income ratio of black family incomes to white family incomes, African-American wealth is only 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% family income ratio and a 5% household wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy practiced in the mid 20th century by the government uh, that has enormous effects still today. That wealth gap, that enormous wealth gap determines much of the racial inequality that we have in this country today. It's um, responsible, as I said, for the concentration of, of children with dis economic and social disadvantages in single neighborhoods. Their parents have no down payments to move to more highly resourced neighborhoods and results in an achievement gap. It's responsible for health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease, in part because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more dangerous and stressful neighborhoods, less access to grocery stores selling fresh food. It's responsible even for the mass incarceration of young black men. And uh, the abuse by some police officers of black youth uh, and, and, and men generally. Uh, I'm not suggesting that no police officers would ever abuse black men if it weren't for uh, racial segregation that is sustained by this achievement gap, but it's much more intense as a result when we concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they have no access to good jobs, <clears throat> no access to uh, uh, transportation even to get to good jobs, no access to schools that aren't overwhelmed with the social and economic disadvantages of their children. We concentrate young men in those neighborhoods. It's inevitable that the police will engage in confrontations with them, that uh, they will adopt tactics uh, that are typical of occupying forces uh, in colonial countries where their role is to um, maintain a order and control of a low income uh, restive uh, neighborhood. Well, there's another consequence of this uh, segregation that we've created as well. And that's uh, very, very dangerous and frightening to me. And I think perhaps to many of you as well. And that is the enormous political polarization that we have in this country today. Uh, it's not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines. We all know that. Uh, how can we ever expect to develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to understand each other, no ability to empathize with each other, 
you know, ability, as I say, to develop a common national identity. That's another consequence of the unconstitutional racial segregation that we've never remedied. Well, let me, uh, um, I think I have time maybe to talk about one other policy, uh, public housing, something we all misunderstand. Uh, we think it's for poor people. It's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country, um, not for poor people. They weren't permitted into public housing. Public housing, it was created for the first time during the depression, the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Roosevelt administration, the New Deal. Uh, it wasn't for poor people, as I say, it was for working class, middle class families who could afford to rent. They had stable jobs. You had to have a stable job to get into public housing. But there was no housing being constructed in the depression. So there was a big housing shortage and public housing was designed to, to, to address that shortage. Uh, the federal government built the first public housing in the country and everywhere it built it, it created segregated public housing, separate projects for blacks and whites, frequently creating segregation in neighborhoods that had previously been broadly integrated. As I mentioned before, we had many more integrated neighborhoods in downtown urban areas than we have today. Uh, the great African-American poet, novelist, playwright Langston Hughes uh, describes how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. It's not how we think of downtown Cleveland today. Um, he said his best friend in high school was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl in high school. It's, he went to an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. But the Public Works Administration, the first New Deal agency, went into that neighborhood, created two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed, and with other similar segregated projects elsewhere in the Cleveland area, created a pattern of segregation that uh, is strong and persists to this day. In my book, The Color of Law, I like to, to describe where I can self-satisfied smug places. They think they're uh, better than Richmond or other places in the country. Uh, one of them I describe is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. It's uh, uh, the area where Harvard and MIT are located. Uh, the area between Harvard and MIT, the Central Square neighborhood was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s, about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration and other federal agencies demolished housing there and built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating segregation there where it hadn't previously existed. Segregation was further intensified by government housing programs during World War II when hundreds of thousands of workers were flocking to centers of war production to take jobs in war industries that hadn't existed during the depression. <clears throat> if the government wanted the tanks and the jeeps and the planes and the ships to be produced, it had to find housing for these migrant workers, black and white, and it did. And everywhere it found it, everywhere it created it, it created segregated housing, segregating workers in their housing who were working in the same war plants. Uh, the West Coast, had very few African-Americans living there prior to World War II. The migration of African-Americans to the West Coast really began and to a significant extent during the war. The federal government had to find housing for workers in the shipyards and the plane aircraft, uh, aircraft uh, factories. And it did. In San Francisco, for example, the government built five projects for war workers, shipyard workers primarily. Four were for whites only one for African-Americans placed in the neighborhood that became the African-American neighborhood of San Francisco. In Berkeley, another one of those self-satisfied smug places, the government with the cooperation of the University of California and the city of Berkeley uh, created a, a large project in which buildings for whites were located near the residential areas and shopping areas of, of Berkeley. And the um, <clears throat> housing for black workers was placed farther away near the industrial area and along the railroad tracks, uh, creating a segregation there. Well, there were many, many other policies uh, followed by uh, federal, state, and local governments to create the segregation that uh, we know today. The policies to redress segregation are well known. No mystery about them. Uh, think tanks, uh, policy experts, housing experts, journalists like me spin out ideas all the time about uh, how to redress racial segregation. What's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to create the political pressure, make it uncomfortable to maintain patterns of segregation in the same way that the, 
uh, civil rights movement of the 1960s made it uncomfortable to maintain segregation in public facilities and uh, transportation and, and um, so on. <clears throat> I can main name a few uh, policies that are obvious that we should follow, but for which there's no political support and for which we need a new civil rights movement to create that support. We should, for example, have an affirmative action program in housing to subsidize African-Americans to move to communities from which they were, their forebears were excluded and which are now segregated all white neighborhoods. Uh, I mentioned before Levittown, as a result of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. Some African-Americans who can afford to buy housing for 300, 400, $500,000 uh, have moved to Levittown. Levittown is now about one to 2% African-American in a broader neighborhood that's about 15% African-American. Well, the difference between that 1% and the 15% that you would expect is the result of unconstitutional segregation practiced by the federal government, uh, a narrowly targeted remedy, constitutional remedy for that segregation would be for the federal government to engage in affirmative action, to subsidize, to sell homes, to buy homes uh, uh, on the open market in Leffetown and resell them at discounted prices to African-Americans who um, could have afforded to, whose forebears could have afforded to move to that community when it was created. Um, but who now, like working class whites, cannot afford to move to communities that are that expensive. A few months ago, I wrote an article, um, uh, I can send it to you if you wish, in which I described a community um, in California that's all white, suburban community, uh, created uh, with government segregation policies and identified in the article, the developer, the bank, the real estate agency that created this uh, community on an all white basis. That developer, bank, real estate agency are still practicing in that community today. A new civil rights movement should create a campaign to persuade that bank, that developer, that real estate agency to create a, perhaps you might call it a voluntary reparations fund to subsidize the movement of African-Americans into a community from which they were unconstitutionally excluded uh, with the cooperation of uh, uh, bigoted private businesses uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, at the um, uh, lower end of the income scale, we have some policies that reinforce segregation today that we should uh, change. The largest policy uh, that we program that we follow to create housing for low income families is called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. It's a program of the U.S. Treasury Department that um, uh, subsidizes builders to uh, uh, create low-income housing. Its priority is to place low-income housing in existing low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. There are very few communities that have uh, taken a proactive uh, uh, role in, in getting more units uh, placed in higher opportunity places, but very few. That program should be redesigned to place a higher priority in placing more of the units, not all of them, we should place good housing in all communities, but place more of those units in higher opportunity places where there's access to good jobs and transportation to get to them and schools that aren't overwhelmed with the social and economic disadvantages of the students and healthy air and grocery stores that sell fresh food. The section eight program, another program that doesn't subsidize developers, it subsidizes families uh, to afford to be able to afford to rent apartments at uh, market rates also reinforces segregation today. The subsidy is calculated on the basis of the median rent in the metropolitan area. And as you can understand, the median rent in the metropolitan area is too low to rent an apartment in a high opportunity community. And it's actually more than you need to rent an apartment in a low income segregated community. So landlords exploit the program by charging more than the market requires, but it reinforces segregation because mostly the only place that Section 8 voucher families can find housing is in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. That program should be redesigned so it doesn't reinforce segregation. Of course, families who want to live in a, in a segregated neighborhood and use their vouchers there should be permitted to do so, but families who want to live in higher opportunity communities should have the opportunity to do so.
Well, there are many, many other policies we could follow to redress uh, racial segregation. Um, perhaps one of the best known is abolishing zoning ordinances uh, that uh, prohibit anything but the construction of single family homes on large lot sizes in communities, no townhouses, no garden apartments, no low level uh, multifamily dwellings, uh, uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, um, those zoning ordinances uh, collaborate with other policies to uh, perpetuate segregation. In my judgment, those zoning ordinances, because they perpetuate an unconstitutionally created segregation, are themselves subject to challenge. Well, I'm involved with a, um, a group of national uh, civil rights leaders, uh, fair housing leaders, to try to help create the kind of civil rights movement, new civil rights movement that's necessary to create the pressure to, to enact policies like this. We call it the new movement to redress racial segregation. We'll be creating local civil rights committees in cities around the country. We plan to launch this new movement to redress racial segregation within a few months. And uh, if any of you are interested in uh, uh, receiving information about the launch, I'd be happy to uh, provide it to you. Uh, with that, I think um, I've used up my time and um, we should leave uh, time for, for questions. So I, I welcome a discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was uh, very interesting. We appreciate you sharing uh, your experiences uh, uh, in this topic. So we've got a lot of questions uh, from our audience. And so I'll dive right into those and see what we can get some feedback for those folks. Uh, so the first question uh, is, have any of the major actors who played a role in segregation in the past publicly acknowledged their role? For example, particularly in uh, the real estate industry, so large developers, uh, real estate associations, things of that nature? Yes, they have. Um, uh, the National Association of Realtors has acknowledged the, the role of the real estate industry in doing this. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, column uh, I wrote uh, a couple months ago about this community in California, the developer has a website in which it uh, acknowledges its role and apologizes, but more than an apology is necessary. Um, what's needed are uh, policies to undo the effects of, um, uh, of the segregation that they created. As I, I said a few minutes ago, one way to do it is to create a voluntary reparations fund that would subsidize families to move into communities from which these uh, real estate agencies and banks and of developers excluded people. Um, many of these real estate agencies and banks no longer exist, but have been absorbed or assumed by successors, successor institutions. And my view is that um, when a, uh, a business absorbs a predecessor business, it not only assumes the uh, economic assets and liabilities of its predecessor, but the moral liabilities as well and has an obligation to take steps to redress segregation. So acknowledging is, is important, but it's cheap. And we need more than acknowledgement of the role uh, in doing this. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what examples, if any, have you seen in your research from uh, US cities that are using specific ways to mitigate the effects of redlining and segregation? Well, as I said, the policies to redress segregation are well known, and there are many examples of small efforts to, uh, to do it. Uh, but they're small, and without um, a, a civil rights movement that's going to create pressure to do more than small efforts, uh, not much will be accomplished. As you may know, Minneapolis, for example, abolished citywide single family zoning uh, a little more than a year ago. Of course, it's not going to have much of an effect unless it's also countywide, which uh, that ordinance doesn't cover. Um, uh, Oregon has abolished single family zoning um, uh, in all of its cities of over 10,000 population. Uh, again, the same thing um, is, is the case. It itself won't desegregate those places, but it's a step in the right direction. Uh, we also need subsidies for families to move to places that are otherwise unaffordable to them. We have places, uh, many communities that um, have public down, down payment assistance programs for first time home buyers who are disproportionately African American and Hispanic. Uh, I think all uh, municipalities, uh, counties should adopt such uh, 
down payment assistance programs to try to rem remedy their roles in creating segregation. We have many places uh, that uh, have inclusionary zoning programs that uh, require new developments of a certain size to uh, include uh, a share of units, both for moderate and for low income families. That's done in a number of places. Perhaps the best example is not so far from you in Montgomery County, Maryland, where they have an inclusionary zoning program that requires any development with 25 units or more to set aside uh, units for moderate income families. And then the uh, public housing um, agency of Montgomery County buys up a third of those set aside units for its public housing program, creating a truly diverse development. It's a terrific program, but it doesn't do anything for the um, vast uh, swath of, of uh, Montgomery County, which is segregated already. It only covers new development and uh, Montgomery County is already well developed. So like I say, there are many, many policies that are being implemented by communities all over the country to redress this um, in small ways. There's some, uh, I, I should mention this, there are some communities, well, I think I said this earlier, that are doing a better job of placing uh, low-income housing tax credit units in higher opportunity places. There are a few places um, um, uh, that, are, uh, enacting, that have enacted a, an experimental program of adjusting Section 8 voucher amounts so they're higher we're used in high opportunity uh, neighborhoods and lower when used in existing segregated neighborhoods, but it's a small experimental program. Every community should have that kind of reform. All right, um, several more questions. Thank you folks for your participation. Uh, so in your view, to order, in order to ensure uh, quality of opportunity, uh, and to some extent, do we need to ensure quality of outcome for some period of time in order to enable the accumulation of wealth needed uh, to feed back into the system so we can positively impact the youngest African-American generation so that we can slowly move the needle towards desegregation and actual equity? Well, I don't think there are many ways to um, create equality of outcome, but we can create equality of opportunity um, we should um, reinstate affirmative action in higher education, which has been rolled back um, in the last uh, 40 years. And as I say, we should create affirmative action programs in housing that um, don't create an equality of outcome, but they, they create the opportunity for African-Americans to uh, live in places that are otherwise unaffordable to them, but that would have been affordable to them had these segregation policies not been enacted. There are many, many programs we can enact. I've mentioned just a few of them to redress segregation. <clears throat> and let me say about this, uh, you know, about a new civil rights movement, you know, we had 20 million Americans uh, participating in um, demonstrations uh, against police abuse uh, last uh, summer and spring. Um, uh, they were, uh, usually led by African-Americans, but most of the participants were white, unheard of any time in American history. We're having a more accurate and passionate discussion about the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow than we ever have had before in American history. And Virginia is one place where it's going on very vigorously as you address uh, you know, the, um, the reification of Robert E. Lee and other uh, Confederate figures. So I, I think we're having that conversation uh, throughout the country. And out of that, I, I'm hopeful that a new civil rights movement will emerge that will begin to create the pressure to create the kinds of policies that uh, we need to redress racial segregation. Let's talk for a minute about uh, uh, judicial review. So where have you seen anything in your research throughout the country that uh, where judicial review has been in place where the courts have recognized uh, the illegal discriminatory effects of single family large lot zoning requirements. And has this zoning been replaced by judicial review or any communities been forced to make any changes along those lines? I'm not aware of any, no, I'm not. Um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the Obama administration had a relatively weak rule uh, called the disparate impact rule, which said that um, under the Fair Housing Act, you could find a violation 
if a policy had a disparate impact on segregation, even if it wasn't um, written to for that purpose. And in my judgment, um, a single family zoning in a community that was created as a segregated white neighborhood, uh, that zoning uh, should be uh, challengeable under a disparate impact standard. The Trump administration um, repealed that rule. I think the Biden administration will reinstate it or some form of it, but it will have to be much, much stronger than the weak one that the Obama administration had. And if we had a, um, uh, a strong disparate impact rule, we could find that under the Fair Housing Act, single family zoning was a fair housing violation. Thank you. Uh, so the historical impacts of segregation seem to compound for those who are disenfranchised. For instance, a family in a poor segregated neighborhood might eventually become priced out of her own neighborhood due to gentrification. That same family may lack the resources, education, connections, et cetera, to access desired neighborhoods, high paying, high paying jobs, and healthy foods. Are there examples of communities or approaches looking at this holistically? In other words, places that acknowledge that it's not just income needed, but it's a slew of variables that have compounded over generations. Well, I don't think there's, we have a comprehensive program like that, but if we enacted enough uh, policies uh, of different kinds, they could reinforce each other to create the, um, the effect that uh, your questioner is talking about. So you mentioned gentrification. I, I keep on saying that we know the policies to do to take care of this. We don't have to allow gentrification to do that. We don't enact the policies because we don't have the political will, not because we don't know what they are. If we wanted to prevent the massive uh, dislocation, uh, displacement of African-American families from traditional African-American neighborhoods through gentrification, we know what to do. We should enact strong rent control policies. We should enact limits on condominium conversions. We should enact the kind of inclusionary zoning program that I described a few minutes ago um, that uh, Montgomery ha County has. And we should have a, a property tax freeze for existing homeowners. Because one of the reasons that the uh, African-American in particular families are being displaced from gentrifying neighborhoods is because they may own their homes free and clear but can no longer afford to live in them because the property taxes go up as the property values rise. So why not freeze property taxes for existing homeowners to prevent that kind of displacement? Um, the uh, former IRS commissioner, John Koskinen, uh, has made a proposal that we freeze property taxes for existing homeowners. And in order to avoid a drain on the public treasury, uh, recoup those lost property taxes at point of sale. So if you, uh, for example, uh, freeze property taxes for a homeowner and the homeowner pays property taxes on her home for 20, 30 year years uh, until before the community gentrifies and then it gentrifies and the, the, the family decides to sell at a much, much higher price, uh, the, the lost property taxes at that point are returned to the public treasury, uh, reducing slightly the enormous capital gain that the, the family would, would uh, reap from that kind of process. So that's a sensible program that would prevent massive dislocation of uh, African-Americans from gentrifying neighborhoods. We don't do it not because we don't know what to do. We don't do it because we don't have the civil rights movement, the political will that's going to force us to do it. Thank you. Uh, a lot of the folks uh, in our audience uh, not only work in, in large cities and large urban and suburban counties, but a lot of them work in small communities, towns, for example, here in Virginia. What advice do you have to those smaller communities uh, that are trying to make an impact on this topic in general? Some of, the, some of the issues don't translate, but still the history is there of segregated communities just on a smaller scale. What's a good starting point for a smaller town or community to start moving the needle on this topic? Well, I, I haven't really thought much about different policies. I think they're basically the same. A down payment assistance uh, would be one. Uh, investment in uh, uh, segregated neighborhoods to improve their quality while enacting the kinds of policies I talked about before that prevent displacement. I, I really, I, I, I'm not going to go on about this because I haven't really thought much that there are different policies in smaller communities than in large ones. Okay. 
Um, one of the things that we, we deal with here in Virginia uh, and a lot of other states do obviously is sea level rise uh, and, and rising waters in coastal communities possess yet another social justice threat to neighborhoods with concentrated poverty. Obviously uh, that's historically a lot of neighborhoods are, are segregated along uh, water, uh, you know, waterways. So they can afford to, to move and relocate. Uh, the city's not, or the community's not reinvested in public assistance or housing. What do you recommend or what have you seen in your research about you know, retrofitting policies, flood resiliencies, and things of those nature? Uh, I'm gonna duck that because I haven't done research on that topic. You know, most of my research is historical and um, I won't take up your time by pretending to know something that I don't know. We appreciate that. Well, can you talk a little bit about something you mentioned in your book? Um, we talk a lot about the courts and federal, state, and local government, but can you talk about the influence of the fourth estate, the media, and also maybe faith-based organizations in their role historically in segregation of communities? Yes, uh, the, um, in my book, I do talk about the fact that, and this again is a collaboration between the public and private sectors. Uh, one of the most powerful institutions that created segregation of urban neighborhoods were churches that tried to preserve the ethnic homogeneity of their neighborhoods in order to prevent uh, African-Americans uh, from moving into them. And every one of those churches, and it's not, wasn't just churches, it was universities, uh, 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 libraries, uh, private libraries uh, that um, uh, engaged in campaigns to exclude African-Americans from their communities, frequently by uh, getting um, uh, land agreements that prohibited sale of, of homes in their immediate environs to African-Americans. Uh, what I talk, focus on in the book is the, the relationship between government and these uh, institutions, or these private institutions, because every one of these had a tax exemption from the Internal Revenue Service, an unconstitutional tax exemption, because it was being granted to a nonprofit institution that was uh, creating segregation. I give in the, in the book, I describe as an example it's not a Virginia example, um, but it's the University of Chicago where the office of the presidency of the president at the University of Chicago maintained a, a legal team whose job it was to evict African-Americans from homes in the uh, neighborhood surrounding the University of Chicago um, uh, because they violated a, um, a deed clause that the university had promoted in those neighborhoods uh, that prohibited African-Americans from living there. Uh, this was uh, uh, for the IRS to have granted a tax exemption to the University of Chicago. And if you add up all the years where this policy was in place, that was substantial, was a massive constitutional violation that requires a remedy. And it gave the same kind of tax exemptions to churches and uh, other private institutions that cooperated in their communities in creating segregation. All right, uh, one last question and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll finish up. Going back to the historical uh, you know, you know, origins of this, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between, particularly in the Southern states, obviously it, it impacted later on with the great migration in some of the Northern states, but in the Southern states in particular, the correlation between Jim Crow laws and then uh, the initial beginnings of segregation and build out of, of residential neighborhoods. Well, you know, Southern states had less um, uh, segregation of neighborhoods than, than Northern states frequently did. Interestingly, the first, um, I talked about public housing before. The very first public housing project built by the federal government was in Atlanta. It was in an integrated neighborhood in uh, downtown Atlanta, near downtown Atlanta called the Flats integrated for the reason I described before. You know, Atlanta had segregated schools and segregated buses and segregated lunch counters, but it integrated neighborhoods because people had to walk to work. The factories were all located in the central district. And um, the first, very first public housing project ever built in this country was built in this neighborhood called the Flats of Atlanta where they demolished housing and built a segregated project for whites only in in um, in this neighborhood, creating a segregation of neighborhoods in Atlanta to complement the segregation of every other institution. So um, I think this is a national phenomenon. I don't uh, attribute it either to Northern or Southern practices. Uh, 
Uh, much of it was driven by the federal government, certainly with cooperation of state and local governments and of the private sector. I'm not suggesting that the private sector didn't share responsibility in this. But if, for example, to take the example I started off my talk with, if the federal government had guaranteed the bank loans of these developers on condition that they sell homes on a non-discriminatory basis, they would have had to do so no matter how much they would have wished to discriminate on their own if they were able to finance it without government help. But they weren't able to finance it without government help. Thank you very, very much, Charles, for this opportunity to, um, to engage with you. I don't know if you send out a, uh, uh, any kind of follow-up to um, uh, participants in this webinar, webinar, but if you do, I can give you some information, uh, links to some of the things I've talked about uh, that your um, participants may be interested in having. Richard, we very much appreciate that. That actually came up into questions quite a bit during your presentation. So we'll be glad to send those out to all of the participants. Okay. We wanna thank you for taking the time with us today. It's been very informative. And also again, thank our sponsors, uh, the Virginia Chapter of American Planning Association uh, and the Virginia Association of Housing and Community Development Officials. Again, Richard, thank you for your time. And thanks to all of you for participating in this webinar uh, hosted by the Virginia Institute of Government. Thanks and have a good day.